Hi everyone, I'm Kelly Longton from Kelly Longton Law, and today I want to talk about estate planning considerations for incarcerated individuals. Now, if you're preparing for or if you're currently incarcerated, the future may be uncertain right now, and proper estate planning may ease some of your worries that you're facing. Regardless of how long your incarceration is for, we're here to help you address your concerns and develop a plan that will protect you and your family for many, many years to come. Now, one of the things you should be thinking about is how will your bills get paid while you're away? A helpful tool to manage your money and property, regardless of the reason, is an immediate durable financial power of attorney. Now, a financial power of attorney allows you to choose a trusted person, which is called an agent, to handle your financial matters for you. Your agent can handle a variety of transactions from signing checks to opening a new bank account, depending on the amount of authority that you give that person. Because it's an immediate power of attorney, your agent will have the authority to act on your behalf as soon as you sign the document or the agent signs an acceptance form acknowledging the responsibility if your state actually requires that. Although your agent can immediately act on your behalf, you'll still have the ability to conduct your own business. You just have the benefit of an additional person being able to act for you. Lastly, by making your financial power of attorney durable, your agent's authority will continue even if you become incapacitated and you're unable to communicate or make those decisions for yourself. Now, a revocable living trust can also be a helpful solution to help you manage your money and property while you're away. An RLT, the Revocable Living Trust, is a trust that you create during your lifetime that can be changed until you become incapacitated or you pass away. Now, this planning tool enables you to name yourself as the current trustee or the person who's in charge of managing it, um, and also you as the beneficiary. So an RLT allows you to continue enjoying all of the money and the property that you have during your lifetime, as well as designate what will happen to that money and property upon your death, protecting it from some chosen recipients, or protecting it for your chosen recipients, I should say. An added benefit of an of a revocable trust is that any accounts and property owned by the trust will not have to go through the probate process. Now, probate is the court-supervised process that must take place in order to distribute the accounts and the property that you own when you passed away to your loved ones. Now, by avoiding probate, you can keep your, your family matters private and out of court and save your loved ones time and money. And if you have a minor child, a revocable living trust may be especially useful for you. You can include provisions in an RLT that specify when and how the funds should be used for your minor child's benefit while you are present. You can also provide instructions to your alternate or your successor trustee for certain expenses to be paid while you are away to ensure that your minor child is provided for in the same way you would provide for your child. Similar provisions can also be included for other individuals in your family who may depend on, upon you for care. Now, should you pass away without proper planning, any money or property that would go to your minor children according to state law will have to be managed by a court appointed person who would could be a, potent, uh, a complete stranger to you. It's not always a relative as, as people think, or it may be a relative that you don't want. Also, once your minor child reaches the age of majority, either 18 or 21, depending on whatever state it's in, the court will give your child the remainder of the money and the property in one lump sum. This means your newly minted adult could spend everything on a wild weekend in Vegas or be taken advantage of by someone wanting your child's money. One caveat re to remember, however, is this type of trust will not protect your money and property from your creditors, including fines, costs, restitution, and other charges associated with your incarceration. Now, another critical concern during incarceration is the care of any minor children that you may have. If your minor child's other legal parent is still alive and able to care for your child, the other parent will continue to provide care or will assume caregiver responsibilities. Nevertheless, it's a good idea to plan for what will happen if both of you are unable to care 
for your minor child just in case. If you are the only living parent or the other legal parent is unfit to care for your child, however, you must make proper arrangements. While most people are familiar with the idea of naming a guardian for a minor child in a last will and testament, this document does not have to does not become effective until you pass away. A will doesn't become effective until you pass away. Therefore, to properly plan for your minor child's care during your absence, you must name a guardian in a separate writing that meets state law requirements. We can discuss planning options available to you under our specific state law. Now, failing to plan can have dire consequences for your minor child. Without instruction from you, the court will use its discretion in deciding who is best suited to care for or to make decisions for your child should you be unavailable. We all know of individuals who appear one way in public but are completely different in private. And because you know your family best, you need to be the one who's making this decision and not a judge. Now the previously mentioned estate planning documents can offer you, you and your family critical support during this time of transition. However, to make sure that you and your loved ones are protected to the fullest extent, there are a few other documents that really are worth mentioning. The first is the medical power of attorney. This document allows you to name a trusted decision maker to communicate your healthcare wishes if you can't do so yourself. Regardless of where you may be, someone must be able to make these decisions for you if you cannot. If you do not formally choose a medical decision maker, your loved ones will face going to court to have someone appointed by a judge to make these medical decisions. This person may not be the one you would have chosen. Additionally, this court process takes additional time and money during an already stressful time. Then you have the living will or advanced directive. They're known by either name depending on your state. And this document allows you to convey your wishes regarding end of life decisions. Because these can be very sensitive topics, it is important that you carefully consider your wishes. This may take a little bit of soul searching, but you must know what you want to happen in certain situations so that your wishes can be properly documented and communicated, communicated to your chosen medical decision maker. Absent specific instructions from you, your medical decision maker will be left trying to figure out what you would have wanted. Not only can this cause additional grief in a difficult situation, but it could also breed disagreements amongst your loved ones if there's a differing opinion on how to best care for you. Now your HIPAA authorization form. This form allows you to grant specific individuals access to your medical information. For example, to get a status update on your condition or to receive your test results without giving those individuals the authority to make decisions on your behalf. By at least providing medical information to your loved ones, you can help quiet the anxieties and uncertainties that often arise during times of emergency. This can also help alleviate tensions between your medical decision maker and the rest of your loved ones. Although only one person will be making medical decisions, the rest of your loved ones will at least understand why these decisions were made. Let's talk about your last will and testament. A last will and testament, also referred to as just a will, is a document where you can name a personal representative or executor, the person in charge of collecting all of your accounts and property, paying your debts, distributing money and property to the, your beneficiaries. You can specify who will receive your accounts and property and name a guardian for your child if that's necessary. Although this document is only useful at your death, it provides a way for you to officially express your wishes. If you fail to have a will, the probate court will determine who gets your money and property according to state law. So let me help you. I understand that you may be going through a difficult time, but I want you to know that we're here to help. Protecting you and your family is our priority. And if you have any questions or you'd like to discuss ways in which we can best serve you and your family, please just give us a call today. We're available for in-person meetings and virtual consultations, whichever is most convenient for you. So I want to thank you for watching here today. I'm Kelly Longton from Kelly Longton Law.